Welcome to this morning's Treasury Committee evidence session on the appointment of uh, Liz Oakes to the Financial Policy Committee. Uh, prior to coming today, uh, Ms Oakes submitted a CV and a questionnaire and it's about to be published on our website in the next few minutes. So I'll start by inviting our witness to introduce herself to us today. Good morning. I'm delighted to be here with you today. Um, so I'm Liz Oakes. I'm a, an independent non-exec director of a European fintech. Um, I'm a very well-known uh, payments expert uh, in the global sphere. I formerly was at MasterCard uh, some time ago, um, but I've recently been appointed by, as a by the Chancellor of the Exchequer uh, to the Financial Policy Committee as an external member. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much for being with us this morning. And as you just highlighted, you've gone through a rigorous selection process organised by the Treasury where they um, have uh, chosen you to be appointed to this uh, vacancy on the Financial Policy Committee. And I just wondered if you could tell the committee at what point in the search process did you realise that you would have to recuse yourself from everything to do with payments, the area which is your area of expertise? Um, yes, it's been a very interesting experience. Uh, it's been a very lengthy process. Uh, it's been probably in the last three to four weeks that that conversation has really crystallised. Um, so was... You were given the offer. Yes. And then they realised that you were actually going to have to recuse yourself from the vast area of decision making on your area of expertise. I think as the process went by, um, it was evident that actually my experience uh, is broader than just payment systems and, and certainly broader than um, the area around stablecoin. Um, I spent many, many years as a consultant uh, where, yes, payments may have been the anchor point for a lot of my um, previous experience, but actually the skill set that I've developed spans a much broader area of expertise. And so in the conversations around, um, you know, the perception of conflict was, was really the critical point where um, the governor took a, a probably a, a stronger view than I w might have taken myself um, on that recusal. Um, Interesting. So you, you went through the entire selection process, the headhunter approached you, you went through the whole interview process, very rigorous. It was decided you were the appointable candidate and it was only at that point that your entire expertise effectively got ruled out of discussions by the governor himself? Um, I wouldn't describe it in, uh, probably as my entire expertise, but I would certainly say it's um, the anchor point for which mo many people know me um, more broadly in the industry. Um, as you'll probably appreciate, I'm sure you'll appreciate that many of the things that I've been doing um, in my professional career have been commercially uh, sensitive or, or you know, uh, particularly um, things around resolution of, of issues within banks or um, the development of, of systems that might interface to payment systems, for example, um, and the running, operational running of systemically important payment systems. Um, many of the skills that I've learned, I believe, are very transferable, and actually understanding operational risk within that and resilience within that type of environment um, has crossover into many other areas that the FPC is, is looking at. In the job description, and the specification that you were sent by the headhunter, did it say they were looking for someone with skills in payment systems? Not specifically, no. Okay. That was a conversation that I had actually with the headhunter was to say, you know, how relevant is my experience in payment systems? Is this something where the, you know, typically with boards or with um, committees, you're looking to fill an expertise gap or a skills gap? Um, that wasn't necessarily the focus. It was interesting to the committee, but it wasn't specific. Okay. Just to clarify the reasons why you've been asked to recuse yourself from all financial policy committee discussions on payment systems, um, just for people who are watching out there, um, you are an executive director of Mango Pay. Non-exec, so I'm an independent non-executive. Non -exec, You're yeah. a non-executive yeah. director of Mango Pay. Uh, and I can see that that is one of the reasons you've been asked to recuse yourself from discussions around payment systems. Secondly, you have significant holdings in MasterCard. Can you tell the committee how significant those holdings are? So I've declared those to the Bank's Conflict Committee. I believe they're, they're not um, material, uh, as, as they have described it. 
Um, but I've been very transparent with that. They have um, ab absolutely um, copies of all of my financial holdings, irrespective. I've been very, very open and transparent. I understand how important that is, uh, both to you, but, but also to the, the wider uh, group at the bank. Um, and that is, uh, as far as I'm, I understand, that is something that is very often the case. It's a legacy shareholding purely from my employment. Are you there. able to sell them or are they locked up for a period of time? There are some that are locked up for a period of time. Uh, there are some that I could sell, but I've made an undertaking to the bank not to do that for the duration of my uh, period. That you I have two choices. You could either not sell them or you could sell them before you start, right? To be honest, I regard them as something for my pension. <laughs> um, I, I don't have any intention of trading those shares in the medium to longer term. They, 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 they're something that are they I significant consider. enough um, for you to have had to recuse yourself from payments issues, even if you weren't a non-executive no. director of Mango Pay? <clears throat> I believe not. I think is that the issue... what the bank's uh, team told you, compliance team told yes, you. Yes, it is. I, I believe that actually it's more about the perception of conflict. Um, my understanding would be also because MasterCard um, owns and operates the Vocalink um, mm. business in the UK, which is you know the operator of systemically important payment mm. systems in the UK. I think it's more about the perception of conflict. Okay. Now, you're also a non-executive director of Advent International Stargate, which is a private equity investor. Yes. And um, to what extent have you been told you'll have to recuse yourself from any discussions on the financial policy consequences of the private equity sector in the UK? We discussed that at length and I, I'm not being recused on that topic. Um, I have no influence over um, the activities of Advent International. Um, the Stargate entity... You don't have any influence on MasterCard either. No, but I probably come with knowledge of how everything operates because I've spent so many years... Um, you must have knowledge context. of Advent International Stargate as well. Uh, Stargate is a holding company that is the parent mm. holding company um, for the Mango Pay um, businesses. I don't have any insight into how Advent itself operates its own business. Um, I wouldn't claim to be an expert on private equity. Uh, You've had a discussion with the bank and they've said you do not need to recuse yourselves in the area of private equity, despite the fact that another member of the Financial Policy Committee told us that uh, they thought private equity was a financial policy risk in the UK. Yes, and I would agree with that statement. You agree it's a risk, yes. but you've not recused on that. Yes. So can you just talk me through what the bank's thinking was on the difference between these two issues? Um, I had a lengthy discussion with the bank secretary, the conflicts officer, around um, to what extent I am involved with anything to do with Advent. Advent happens to be the owner uh, of the, both the Stargate and Bango Pay businesses. Um, I'm involved, my role is involved it, with Mango Pay specifically and also with Stargate is around governance, risk and compliance, um, the, you know, the direction of the business, not Advent. So I actually have no influence whatsoever over decisions Advent makes about divestment or acquisition um, of that business. Okay. Uh, so in that instance, uh, they saw no conflict. And this has all been documented and minuted and a decision has been taken by the governor on this one as well? I believe so, yes. You believe so? I haven't seen that documented decision, but I believe so. Um, so was there a documented decision on recusing yourself from all the payments systems decisions? I have not seen it, um, but I believe there probably is. Uh, okay. I'm happy to take that away as something to, to go and find out more about right. myself, to be honest, okay. because uh, it's, it's all happened quite quickly in the last few weeks. Okay. And what was your motivation in applying to be a member of the Financial Policy Committee? What was it about your background that uh, made this role appeal? Um, so to, uh, I'm quite happy to share that uh, I didn't, um, it didn't occur to me in the first instance. I was approached by a headhunter. Um, and as they uh, described in more detail what the F FBC is looking for and, and how the FBC operates, um, I was very interested and excited about the role. Um, I have a background in risk management that goes back specifically around the payment systems and um, banking in the UK and, and abroad over the last 25 years, um, something I've been working on you know, since I started my career. Um, it's an area that's 
<coughs> sorry, very close to the operational experience that I've had. And I think I can bring to bear more insight from industry, both in terms of um, you know, the operationalization of some of these policies. You know, what does it actually mean when you have to do something that the FPC has asked for? Um, but also, my focus since leaving MasterCard has also very clearly been on growth companies. And so the aspect around how do you balance risk management with innovation, growth, and enterprise is something that is really important to me. And I think it's quite often very difficult when you look at um, the regulatory agenda to see where those two things come together. Uh, it's not as apparent. And the, so the interests of industry are quite often um, not necessarily front and centre in the decisions that are being made, or that, that's not how it appears. So that, that perception and communication um, is, is really interesting to me. You must be disappointed that so much of your expertise is something that you will not be able to contribute because you've been asked to recuse yourself from so much to do with the payment system that is the work of the Financial Policy Committee. Well, I asked the same questions, actually, of, of the uh, Bank Secretary and was assured that also many of the areas that I've been working in previously um, are the remit of either the FMI uh, team at the bank or other parts of the regulatory supervision area of the bank, whether that's the PRA or the FCA. So to the extent to which um, I will still be able to have conversations and support team members within the bank where they are making um, investigations or decisions or have thoughts or you know, want to talk about things, I'm very happy to do that. I think it's just I will draw a boundary around um, decisions that are made at the FPC regarding issues to do with the payment systems. And in your opinion, it would not be worth you selling your shares in MasterCard or stepping down from Mango Pay in order to take up this role where you could have a complete uh, oversight of all the issues that the Financial Policy Committee is looking at. So, I think to start with, it wasn't suggested. Um, secondly, from a personal standpoint, I think actually that uh, for me, I find that it grounds me in reality uh, working with uh, companies like Mango Pay uh, in terms of the challenges and the the day to day um, issues that come up around you know being an EMI in the UK or being an EMI across Europe and the development of technology and the development of those services. So actually, for me, the EMI just for the benefit sorry. of the television audience is electronic, electronic. money. Institution. Yeah. Okay, all right. I um, figured that one out. <laughs> um, so it, it's it's helpful, I find, to have that commercial flavour of what is the reality actually look like on the ground. Um, I don't have any desire to sell my Mastercard shares just because I it didn't appear to be something that was required. I'm, I don't believe that that has actually been what has. Uh, if you were decision. required to do it, would you take up the position? Yes. You would? Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, because this committee, what you may have read what we've said about MasterCard, have you, in the past? Not specifically. No. Okay. All right. Um, Stephen. Uh, good morning, and thank you for coming to give evidence this morning. <coughs> um, back in December, uh, there was an extract <coughs> from the Financial Policy Summary which said... Uh, they're maintaining a neutral setting of the UK countercyclical buffer in the region of 2%, and that would help to ensure banks continue to have capacity to absorb unexpected future shocks without restricting lending. So I guess I have two immediate questions. First is, in regard to the countercyclical buffer, what circumstances, could you set out for us what circumstances you see would be appropriate for the FPC to consider either reducing it or increasing it? And at the moment, in terms of the balance of probability, would you be arguing for it to be increased or reduced? Thank you. It's a really uh, co probably complex area. I, I look forward to actually learning an awful lot more about the countercyclical buffer and how it operates um, in the coming weeks. I think, for me, the, it's a very important mechanism to be able to uh, ensure that lending continues to flow in the market when there is a crisis of some kind happening. And, and that's certainly what we've seen during COVID. And it, you know, the idea that the 
the FPC can react quite quickly and enable banks to be able to continue lending out into the market uh, when there is a, a time of distress is very important. Um, at the moment, I understand that the counter-cyclical buffer has been reinstated at the 2%, and the idea is to, to ensure that there is enough there to be able to cope with any incremental crisis that comes along. So in the context of the fact that it is counter-cyclical, um, I would imagine that at the moment the focus would be more on looking at whether vulnerabilities are building again in particular segments of the market and whether therefore there is a need to raise the counter-cyclical buffer. Um, given current inflation rates, interest rates, um, I, I would probably not see that there was any argument right now to decrease it um, or to release it. Um, so. I don't know if that answers your question. Well, yeah, sort of. I mean, I think that it's difficult. I mean, the economic circumstances at the moment would appear there is a mark. The economy appears to be marginally Im improving. And uh, we saw the re revision to GM, uh, GDP numbers last week. Um, so I guess that I, I hear what you say. And, and of course, there, was, there have been academic and BIS studies about the impact on loan growth, depending on where the buffer is set at. Although there have been a number of recent academic studies which are suggesting that perhaps uh, we haven't fully understood the impact and I was just wondering if you'd looked at any of those and whether or not you felt that um, the impact on bank lending when the buffers are released what impact that would be uh, and also whether you think the impact is symmetrical whether they're released or expanded. So one of the questions I have myself and I look forward to digging more into this is how operationally you can actually use the buffer. Um, so if the buffer is released, bearing in mind banks would quite clearly look at this and think, OK, so the buffer is being released, but when is it coming back again? Uh, so how long do you have? And what is the duration and maturity of lending that can be achieved in that time frame? So that, for me, is actually an operational practical question that I look forward to digging into to find out, OK, so if you release the buffer, that's great, but uh, do banks then in reality actually use the buffer and, and how do they use it and what does it actually mean? Because if you turn around in 12 months' time and say, okay, we're over that immediate crisis, we're going to build the buffer back again, you can't turn around to the businesses you've just lent money to and ask them for it back. It doesn't work quite like that. So are you arguing that the buffer has some significance but the reality is that we should be looking at longer lasting measures that have an impact? Potentially, or there may be an, a way of tiering um, how the buffer is used, for example. I, those are just ideas in my own head. Um, I, I would need to learn far more, I think, about how it actually works in practice. So was one of the recent studies was suggesting that, although it was you know, one of the concerns about releasing the buffer is whilst it has the positive effect of releasing lending, it may take higher risk-taking. And the reality is that, or at least two of the recent studies are suggesting that actually that higher risk-taking, it doesn't happen. I wouldn't necessarily assume that the availability of funds for a bank to lend influences their risk level that they will take on. I think those two things don't necessarily correlate. So you're not surprised by that I'm not finding. surprised by no. it at all. Um, can I just ask whether you think, uh, in terms of macro prudential tools that the FPC has, sorry, I've got hay fever. I'm not crying at any answer. Um, do you think, the, in terms of the macro prudential tools that the FPC has, for instance, in regards to housing, whether or not they need reform or updating? They appear to be working very well at the moment. Um, I don't feel at the moment that there is a requirement to reform them. Um, I believe that there's ongoing work on stress testing, on all sorts of uh, desk-based and practical exercises looking at you know, the impact of uh, the current policy tools. Um, in terms of things like the mortgage market, we seem to be, whilst many households are under duress, it seems to be holding up. Um, so I don't have a view that there is anything chronically wrong or that anything that, that needs immediate reform. And are there any, looking back at the sweep of recent uh, history, are there any decisions that the FPC have taken which you think um, could have been done differently or would have been better if, the, if they'd acted more swiftly or, or taken different decisions in terms of the economy or the financial services sector? 
think that, you know, I guess one area that will always come up is the LDI crisis, where clearly it was something that was identified quite a long time ago as being a potential risk. Um, at the same time, I think with the benefit of hindsight, it's easy to look back and say we should have picked that up earlier. Um, but often these risks don't materialise or crystallise in the way that you anticipated at the time. So I think the fact that somebody had thought about it previously and actually figured out that there may potentially be even be a problem is a good starting point. Um, but given the complexity of the markets and the complexity of you know, both technology and systems, and how all of these different things are connected, I'm not convinced that we could ever predict every single potential plausible shock. Um, the question is whether or not we can put enough resilience into the marketplace to be able to deal with it when it happens. Well, you can't predict. I mean, there are a number of unexpected shots, and we can't predict all of them. But do we have the tools at the moment, and the committee heard from some of the forecasting problems that the bank is now looking at, do we have the tools at the moment in the FPC that allow you to anticipate or look at, you've cited LDI, uh, look at some of the shocks that are definitely going to happen? So I haven't started yet, so I look forward to finding out more about uh, th those tools and how they operate, and particularly um, for me, the, the, around the counter-cyclical buffer, um, uh, all the indicators that are used and the data elements that are collected, I'm, I'm quite a data-driven person, so I'm looking forward to actually finding out more about those. On, that, on your first meeting at the FPC, and the chairman gives you the floor um, to say what your concerns are, what would you say at the moment your concerns are, what will you be outlying in terms to the FPC? Um, given that I've not been privy to data or a, a huge amount of information um, prior to starting, I don't start until the, the 3rd of June, which is interesting because it is at the beginning of that cycle, so I, I will have a very fast uh, uptake of information. Um, I look forward to finding out more uh, from the current work that the FPC is working on. Um, I understand it's around things like private equity. Uh, there, are, there are a number of topics coming to the to the office to the team, um, but I'm not right now. I'm not party to enough information to say precisely what that context of that meeting will be. Okay. One final question, if I may: If you you've obviously had a chance to look at how financial uh, supervision happens in other countries. How would you say the FPC compares and where are there any positives or deficits that need adjusting or correcting? More broadly, not just the FPC, but the operation of the, the tri three committees uh, within the bank and also the, the, the regulatory framework in the UK is very highly regarded around the world. Um, quite often I, I've worked in circumstances where other countries are trying to copy what we've done. Um, Quite often when they copy things, they then innovate themselves and come up with things that are particular to their own markets or, or come up with innovations that we might look upon and think, OK, actually we should do the same thing. Um, it's a continually evolving uh, situation. But in general, um, I think it's very, very highly regarded. Thank you very much, Stephen. Therese. Thank you, Ms. Soakes, and thank you for coming today. The 18 months ago, we had the situation with the... Um, mini budget, the LDI um, uh, kind of uh, element that happened there. And in terms of market based finance, it certainly seems to be the case that the underlying vulnerabilities in the system identified by the FPC are largely unaddressed. Um, I just wanted to get a sense from you on thinking that through about. Um, do you agree with that assessment that the FPC have made? Um, and what do you think could be done to, um, are more powers needed? What should be done to improve transparency and reporting? Um, could the bank have acted earlier to mitigate the risks which have been highlighted on LDIs already? So I think to the beginning of your question uh, around um, do I agree with the FPC, I think at this point I have no information to disagree. Um, uh, so broadly, I think yes, because we have a system where we've had a build-up of um, activity and investment from the private credit and private uh, equity sector that is less transparent, shall we say, than the regulated environment under the PRA, the FCA. Um, so that by its very nature means that there is less transparency. I think the other thing to bear in mind is that these flows of funds are global and international in nature. And so 
in order to actually obtain more transparency, it will require collaboration and um, work with other regulators around the world. It's also something then to consider, you know, so how does the UK want to position itself in the context of those flows of investment funds and particularly how that, would inve that investment fund flow would impact the corporate sector? Do you think the bank unilaterally could have acted earlier, though, to mitigate the risks that we then saw exposed fully in um, autumn 22? I don't know. Okay. Um, just thinking it through on terms of you talked about this being an international element, and I think uh, you've stated regulators should remain mindful of the benefits and, and non-bank financial <coughs> institutions bring to the economy um, and its competitiveness that needs to be maintained vis-a-vis -vis other jurisdictions. Where does the balance between competitiveness and prudence lie in assessing the financial stability risks from these non-bank financial institutions? I think one of the complexities is leverage. The extent to which um, other financial system members may be exposed at different layers and levels of private equity investment in corporates and in uh, funds to the extent where you can't actually assess portfolio risk um, because then you have potentially leverage or exposure that a, a bank or financial institution is exposed to private equity or private credit and they don't actually know about it. And I think that's probably um, the, the biggest area of concern. I think, secondly, whilst I recognise that non-bank financial institutions play a very important role, not just in financing companies as they grow, but actually providing advice, capability and competency in, in improving the management of companies, um, they do need to be mindful of the debt burden that they're placing on organisations, uh, particularly in, a, in, in the economic cycle, at the point at which we are now in the economic cycle where interest rates have risen, uh, inflation is rising. I think we've had a benign environment for a very long time, and now the picture has changed and we need to figure out how to deal with that. Hey, um, you mentioned there about it being global. Um, should the bank and regulators in the UK be doing more to effect, mitigate risks that we have here effectively while awaiting an international agreement because there is a risk that if we just wait for an international agreement then those risks could could grow um, even bigger I, I would think yes well to start with I think we take our own decisions as a country and, and regulate our own industries in the way that we see fit many countries will choose to follow that uh, quite honestly um, I don't think you could wait around for international cooperation forever. At the same time, um, there does have to be consultation. We do have to be mindful of the impact that it might have, not just on other jurisdictions, but on that flight of capital out of the UK, should we impose regulatory burdens that were unsustainable. Um, so it's a very fine um, balancing act, I think. I think you just um, mentioned that. Was it Advent International? Is that the holding company you referred to earlier? Or is Advent that... is a private equity company. Private equity, sorry. Um, uh, sorry, I thought I heard the phrase uh, holding company. Earlier. But in terms of, I mean, the bank has been um, not sceptical about private equity, but increasingly uh, concerned on some of the things you've just raised about increasing leverage. Do, do you anticipate, could there be a collapse in private equity? I'm afraid that's not something I feel appropriately informed to comment on. Um, I mean, we've seen aspects in the water industry. The water industry has a different economic regulator. Um, uh, we've seen how private equity has uh, historically, I think going back to the noughties, um, massively leveraged, in particular Thames Water. And that rate of leverage has, despite of what trying to get it to do so, has not really come down. But uh, um, are there any particular aspects in private equity that do concern you um, in terms of uh, what could be done in terms of financial stability risks? Um, and this is just my, pers this is just my personal it. opinion. Um, I, I would think that concentration risk uh, in private equity, in the same way that we saw with Silicon Valley Bank, for example, um, if you have concentration risk in any sector where you've just invested in one particular um, area, then you leave yourself open to a fall or a particular uh, impact in that area ruining your portfolio. So I think that there's definitely something there around uh, balancing 
um, expertise and uh, you, know, you often will find that uh, teams in particular organisations will go after or invest in things that they know and are comfortable with, um, but actually there is a need for portfolio um, analysis and, and a lack of concentration risk. Mr. Prisoner, who's already a member of the FPC, has um, raised the issue of um, there is an attractiveness to going private. Uh, you don't have quite the same number of requirements um, on the banking industry. Um, the risk, though, is that going into this more shadowy is too strong a word, but um, uh, more opaque financing uh, avenues. Um, has regulation in the banking industry caused or exacerbated risk financial stability um, posed by the non-bank system, the sector? Um, I think the burden of regulatory oversight um, is not uh, unknown to these organisations um, and, and many will choose to operate, whether it's through you know, regulatory oversight or licensing um, regimes in different ways to suit their business model. It is challenging, it's a challenging overhead um, to, to actually have to meet all of the requirements of multiple regulators in multiple jurisdictions um, on top of the needs of, uh, you know, as a, pu- as a public company reporting out uh, to, the sh- to the stock market. So I think, you know, people take different paths and, and particularly at different times in the cycle of that business. They may, I've seen companies go public, then go pr- t- be taken private, and then go public again or be sold off. So I think it depends on the, the growth trajectory and, and what they're seeking to achieve. Um, I'm not entirely sure that I would trade off that activity as being something that is a reaction to uh, regulation. Okay, that's helpful. Um, moving into other aspects of risk, climate change and nature. Um, how adequately do you think that businesses in the financial sector are mitigating for the, against the risks of climate change? We've had TCFD, um, I'm hoping we'll get TNFD, uh, to be thinking about that long term. Um, is there anything more they could do or should do? I hope that we all feel we should do more. Um, I feel we're very early in the cycle of how we're going to do this and what gets done. Um, I do rightly see it's the role of government to dictate kind of the pace at which these things happen and the, the way in which um, the FPC or other regulators gets involved in figuring out you know, what our role is in this. Climate change is, I find, is incredibly complex from a financial policy committee perspective in that it's both the physical aspect of dealing with the changes that it brings. And I've certainly been at the forefront of that in my career in terms of location of data centres and um, you know, having to think about what happens if there's a hurricane and what happens if there's an earthquake and what happens with telecommunication lines go down and how do you actually um, put resilience in place, operational resilience in place to deal with some of these challenges. So that side of it I'm acutely aware of um, and very interested in you know, how do we make increased use of the cloud, for example, to actually mitigate those risks and figure out other ways of operating. In terms of the actual costs of transition and the move to, towards net zero, I think that's something that I personally have on my list of things to learn more about. Okay. Um, uh, particularly as it pertains to the insurance market, um, because insurance is just not an area that I've spent a huge amount of time in. That's useful to know. Um, the Chancellor um, adjusted the remit, um, removing specific environmental sustainability and climate change from the four, moving into more into productive finance, um, boosting productive finance. I just wanted to get a sense of um, the variety of primary and secondary objectives. Um, to support the government's overall objectives for growth and, and, and employment and housing. Um, is there any sense uh, of where you think those could end up being in conflict or there are too many things now that you're trying to cover uh, when ultimately it's about market stability? I don't feel that there's a conflict because I believe that um, all of these elements are intrinsically part of the challenge. Um, for me, climate change is probably something that I've been working on for a number of years as, as an example and it's transitioning now more into a fact of life a mainstream element of all of the conditions that we have to look at um, 
to me, that's also potentially a growth area. So how do we invest in the right type of technologies, the right type of capabilities and competencies? Um, so I don't necessarily think that it's a conflict. It's just a change in the way that we operate. One of the things that you've mentioned in your um, questionnaire was talking about actively engaging uh, and communicating the FPC's work with the public and industry, hosting citizens, panels and similar. Why does that matter? Why does the role of the matter FPC matter to our constituents? I guess at a very personal level, I had not really heard an awful lot about the FPC before I entered into this process. Um, I guess I knew it existed. I'd come across um, members on occasion. Um, I knew that there are lots of committees within the bank that um, you know, work on these things. So I had comfort that there was uh, lots of activity going on. But I'd never really thought about what is the role of the FPC and what does it do. Um, so I think for market participants, it's one thing, because they probably read all of the fantastic reports that we put out um, and spend a lot of time looking at the Bank of England website. I'm not convinced that the general public actually does. Um, so I think that for people to have certainty, to have um, that more of a sense of security that there is actually work going on to maintain the stability of the financial markets is really important. Um, I think there is a very interesting question about the difference in communication styles, in, in how we get the message across. Um, I understand that the bank's uh, teams re have reached out to schools and to various different communities. Um, so I'm looking forward to actually finding out more about that. I'm very happy to get involved. What it's worth, I advocate listening to Steph McGovern and Robert Peston's The Rest is Money podcast. It brings a lot of uh, things together in a very communicated way. Um, I'll leave it there. Okay. Thank you very much, Doris. Samantha. Thank you, Chair. Um, given that the bank, of, the bank rate appears to have plateaued for the time being, um, to what extent have financial instability risks arising from interest rates rises being contained, in your opinion? So, I guess uh, I, I'm definitely not here to comment on um, the current decisions um, around interest rates. That's absolutely for the, for the MPC to determine. Um, in the context of the risks around both inflation and high interest rates, um, my understanding is at the moment we don't see uh, an extraordinary level of um, financial stability issues uh, in, the, in the sense that uh, the mortgage market is functioning well. Uh, we don't see a huge amount of default. Um, I do recognise, however, though, that the current situation has put pressure on an awful lot of households around the, world, around the country. <clears throat> and that that continues to be a, a pressure point. Um, and despite the fact that inflation may be uh, coming down or, or plateauing, it doesn't negate the fact that price rises have gone up quite considerably over the last few years, and they're not going down anytime soon. Um, so I think the, the question uh, for me is more around how will the current rate actually feed into the market because there is a lag. And so as people are continuing to have to refinance their mortgages during this year, as the rate hasn't come, come down yet, um, that continues to be a problem. And for many people, the interest rate that they were on previously on a fixed rate, there may be a considerable differential between that and the rate that they come on to now. Um, so I think that there is, um, there is a, you know, an experience that we're all going through as, as members of the public, and then there's uh, what is the financial stability challenge. Um, as I understand it from looking at the numbers and looking at the percentages of default, etc., we're currently in a, in a, we've come out of the crisis in a reasonably good way. But to what extent does the sustainability of household debt depend on unemployment remaining low? I would, I would agree. It does re depend on unemployment remaining low. And I think we've stress tested to a level of 8% unemployment, which is obviously not where we are now, thankfully. Um, but I do get comfort from the fact that the stress tests have gone to those extremes and to quite a significant extreme of um, default rates within mortgage holders um, and that the banking system can withstand that. Would you say that financial instability risks arising from businesses are greater than or less than those arising from households? Um, the large business sector appears to be robust and continuing to, to be profitable and, and to maintain its path. Um, 
I do recognise that in small businesses in particular, uh, there is uh, much more of a challenge. Um, small businesses are much more dependent on different forms of finance than larger businesses. They have less um, opportunity to raise finance in the market. And that is, that is something that I think we just all see on the high street at the moment. And how concerned are you about the growth in highly leveraged corporate loans and private credit in businesses? Does that worry you? Or? I'm not sure that I'm particularly worried about it in the sense that um, it is a, a valid way of growing a business. Um, the extent to which corporates actually avail of that type of finance is is reasonably mitigated in the sense that it's not a prevalent or a predominant source of funding. Um, so I'm not overly concerned. What's the potential for high public debt levels in major economies to lead to financial instability risks in the future? And what can central banks do to mitigate such risks? So we are running at very high public debt levels globally. I think that that's just a feature of what we've been through in the last few years, whether it's, um, you know, particularly with the pandemic, um, governments around the world have stepped in with huge injections of funding into their national economies to support uh, resilience. I'm not sure that I, I, I would agree that it is a challenge, it's a problem. I'm not sure that there's an awful lot that uh, can be done about it in that that is where we are in the current cycle given what has happened in around the world. Um, so would, you, would you say that there's a danger um, that the absence of major repercussions from that higher public debt has lulled people into a false sense of security around public sector debt levels? I find it very hard to comment on kind of what the man on the street believes about public sector debt levels, um, but I, I believe that if, you, if we communicated well that actually we still have to, to deal with the aftermath of the huge government support that was injected uh, during the pandemic, uh, that people would understand that. I think the vast majority of people who you know, may have been furloughed or received uh, loans through many of the schemes um, haven't forgotten that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Samantha. Angela. Thanks very much. Um, you've said that you believe current geopolitical and cyber risks have the potential to pose significant threats to financial stability, which seems quite obvious to me. But do, do, you, do you want to tell us a bit more about um, how you see that playing out and what can be done to mitigate? Um, thank you. So I'll, I'll take them separately to start off with. Um, so I think we're in an unprecedented time in just in terms of the number of, um, uh, whether it's wars or, or political instability, um, given what's happening with uh, Russia and the Ukraine, uh, what's happening in the Middle East, um, various other uh, things happening in, in jurisdictions such as Venezuela and Guyana um, that, that just cause significant disruption to trade, to trade finance, to um, displacement of people, um, general uh, uncertainty. And, and I think uncertainty actually often is the thing that drives uh, that financial instability. Um, not knowing you know, how long the, the, any of these um, events is likely to last, for example. Is it a short-term problem? Is it a longer-term problem? What does, it, what does it mean for the economies of countries that are supporting or uh, countries whose trade has been disrupted? Um, so that's kind of what I mean by geopolitical risk. I personally had the experience of having to um, close down a business in Russia when sanctions were imposed. Um, the complexity of trying to do that uh, was quite significant. It's quite financially disruptive to uh, an organization. Um, it's also disruptive to you know, counterparty credit lines, to the ways that people operate and do business. Um, so I think you know, other companies will have experienced similar shocks. In terms of cyber, um, it's undoubtedly the, the one threat that all companies, financial or non-financial, are worried about. Ransomware attacks are, are very prevalent. Um, 
but also just the individual consumer or the, the individual person on the, on the street is you know witnessing um, both the repercussions of cyber attacks where their data has been leaked or and potentially then they see uh, you know whether it's lots of emails phone calls people trying to scam them um, so the, the combination of kind of cyber financial crime and AI is probably the, the thing that worries me and what do you think the uh, that the uh, the the policy committee can do about it and um, given that these things are coming from different places from state actors from terrorist or crime yeah. groups all focusing not only in on trying to blackmail companies and that's the ransomware style attacks but also to fraud individuals which the FCA tends to deal with in our jurisdiction but all of it is about markets not being clean um, and some of it is about hybrid war involving authoritarian countries. How, how does uh, the committee you're about to join get to deal with this and, and what would make you feel less worried um, about it? What kind of protections do you think need to um, be inaugurated? Because at the moment our capacity to tackle fraud seems to be, I think, pathetic would be my assessment of it. I think from the context of the, uh, the FPC, um, the focus is very much on financial stability of both market infrastructures and market participants. And I think that that's, where, that's somewhere where we can really lean in um, to make sure that operation re operational resilience, which is uh, the subject of a recent paper by the committee, um, is really um, coordinated. It would, be, it would be kind of where I'm coming from in the sense of the more that you can talk to other market participants, share experiences, share um, best practices in terms of fighting this, uh, then the more resilient the UK will be as a result. Um, it's very much an ecosystem challenge in that um, you know, threat vectors come in to various different actors in the market. Um, it, it's not a question of, you know, I'm okay because I've fixed mine, because actually the person next to me also, we all interact with each other. So. Um, the challenge is, is a collective challenge rather than an individual one. And I think moving that conversation on to the fact that it's, it's, this is not just a line of business um, cost to one business, this is pr about protecting all of us, uh, is something that the FPC can lean in on. You talked about closing down a business in mm -hmm. Russia. Well done for doing that because obviously there are sanctions and you have to do that. Um, but we've been taking evidence on the effectiveness of sanctions against Russia on this um, committee and we heard last week that not a single um, inquiry has been, from Bill Browder, not a single inquiry has been opened in this jurisdiction by any of the uh, agencies um, dealing with any piece of Russian money laundering. Do you think that that is a and a, a, a worry for, from a financial stability point of view because it seems to me that um, our reputation is that our markets are getting dirtier um, rather than cleaner. I haven't had exposure to the information um, that, that I think you're alluding to in terms of what the uh, regulatory authorities here have been uh, looking at from an anti-money laundering or KYC perspective. Um, it is a very complex um, thing to, to, to tackle. Um, it, it's often a, a question of post-event reporting when you actually determine or find out what has been happening, um, partly because of the, the challenges that we have in ownership records and beneficial ownership records, particularly outside this jurisdiction. So trying to identify who the beneficial owner is, and, and quite often it's hidden through layers of organisations, different names, different jurisdictions, and at the end of the day, when you impose sanctions on, the, on any entity or, or individual, they will seek out whatever means they can to continue to do whatever business they were doing or to trade, um, and, and they can be quite um, creative about how they go about doing that. So um, I can understand that actually it's a, it's a huge challenge. I suspect that we're under-resourced and underfunding that area. There's no doubt about that. And, and, and the question usually comes down to, well, who's paying for it and who's, who's mandated with that activity to, to actually take that forward and, and, and crack on and, and find those people? And then what do you do about it if, when you identify who they are? 
But it, this is an issue for financial stability, isn't it? At this point, I don't know. I'd like to investigate that and come back. So you don't much worry about whether markets are clean or dirty, whether they're infiltrated by terrorist money or Putin's oligarch mates money or uh, any other kind of drug narco money. Uh, so that's not a problem for the functioning of markets from your point of view. So I am very concerned about it and, and from a personal standpoint have um, you know, advocated and, and been working on effective anti-money laundering controls and, and terrorist financing controls for many, many years. Um, I do recognise it's a very complex area. I think the, the focus of the Financial Policy Committee, though, has been on financial stability. Um, to the extent to which we believe we have very robust controls, particularly in the wholesale markets in the UK, um, I do believe that you know, there is significant activity in, in every day in trying to stop, track and trace and monitor uh, what is happening. And I've been involved in that for, from a domestic standpoint in the UK. Um, so that you'd be in favour then, would you, of, of transparency in terms of beneficial ownership, of dealing with um, uh, tax havens and the opaque nature of trusts and funding that comes and hides in those places? Very much so. And I look forward to the um, reforms to Companies House that I believe will actually make a significant difference in, uh, in moving that agenda forward. What about transparency of beneficial ownership for trusts and things like that? As I understood it, um, that is something that is, that is moving forward. Well, at a snail's pace is probably what I'd say. Um, in terms of the changes to interest rates that are happening at the moment, and you, you referred to this really given your private equity um, contacts, that... The model for private equity in the past has been to buy up companies, restructure them, quite often load them with debt, take money out for profits and leave them very indebted when they're sold on. Um, that's really not a model that does anything but cause risk now, is it, given that interest rates have risen so mm. high and servicing that debt is so much harder. So, so just to be clear, that's not, uh, that wouldn't characterise my experience of private equity. Um, I have not operated in or around organisations that have been operating in that way. Um, my experience of private equity, though, has been much more from um, the perspective of operating a business that, that may have been owned by private equity. Um, and certainly I've acquired a business that had previously been owned by private equity. And, and actually the case was almost the opposite in terms of um, <clears throat> the input that the private equity company had, had put in in terms of upping or improving the management and improving um, the effectiveness of the business. Um, in terms of what you described around uh, you know, loading up companies with debt, I'm sure that that, that does happen. Um, it, it, it's just not been my experience to date. So I don't really have a very strong view on that right now, but it's something that I look forward to learning more about. Okay. Thank you very much. Annie. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Hi. A few questions about general risks, but just sort of going back to the, as it were, the day before yesterday, which was before the huge expansion of innovation in payment systems and in, uh, and in financial services generally. Um, do you regard the duopoly of MasterCard and Visa as a problem and a risk? And do you think that the, you know, the expansion of, of, of new innovative uh, payment systems are going to help alleviate uh, the potential risk there, or do you think we might see, a, you know, in due course, a greater concentration of these new models? How much do you think of there, there being a problem of the concentration of providers up till now and going forward? So I uh, will caveat this with it. it's very difficult to comment given uh, uh, previous activities I've been involved in. Mm. Um, I've never regarded it as being a competition issue, and that's partly probably because I've been operating in a global capacity where there is very effective competition, um, in the sense that um, there are other operators out there, there's a long list, yeah. um, I don't necessarily want to specify names here, 
I think in um, specific markets, there is probably also a perception that there is uh, limited competition. Um, at the end of the day, the, those choices have been uh, choices that have been made largely by issuers in the past in the UK. So, you know, we could easily have had a third scheme in the UK, um, but to be, you know, open and transparent about it, banks have made choices to close down those schemes in many jurisdictions mm. because payments are typically a volume game and you really need large, very large volumes to be able to operate um, a reasonable size business uh, to be profitable or to be efficient. And, and that's actually probably got more complicated as the years have gone by with cyber security challenges and, and with technology investments required. Um, yeah. So, for me, actually, the ownership is less of a challenge. The question is about good management yeah. and effective controls. And, and that, that, for me, is a theme across many, many jurisdictions. It's really about how do we sort this out? Because the ownership of it quite often is not involved in the day-to-day -day decision. Okay, well, let me, let, me, let me come on to a more specific uh, issue that is to do with the management of the systems um, and we've discussed cyber you know, security uh, large-scale threats operational errors seems to be a potential risk as well and that's that you, you've identified before do you think that the increasing complexity and the innovation in the market is increasing or decreasing the risk of actual operational errors in the way we manage our financial services um, I look at it very much in it's almost like peeling an onion um, the outer layers are typically where we see tremendous innovation, particularly at a consumer level, the interface with customers. Um, and at the core, then, you have uh, payment systems kind of operate or, from a, an RTGS out to, you know, from the central bank clearing and settlement to the operation of um, platforms that intermediate between the various market participants. For me, the, the introduction of new players and new participants is a feature of innovation and growth in the economy. Um, the question then is how do we manage those risks appropriately? Um, so things like open banking, for example, have widened the span of market participants that are involved in this area, um, some of whom understand how to manage risk um, and some of whom are you know, technology providers that are just starting down this path. Um, so having robust measures around that is very important. Okay. Yes, I mean, I suppose I'm trying to understand whether, whether the increasing digitization and technology involved actually makes it more or less likely for things to go wrong. But, I mean, uh, uh, let me ask another specific one, which, and I think you've identified it in your really helpful answers to the, in the questionnaire, is about herding and the effect of AI and machine learning on sort of pro-cyclical decision making that the systems might use and again perhaps in response to potential risk there, yeah. there might well be a, a, a tendency to, to bunch together. How, how serious do you think that risk is and what can be done to mitigate it? So I see it probably uh, appearing as a risk in two separate places in my mind. One is in the wholesale markets where potentially on trading systems uh, you could see that type of activity. Um, Secondly, in just in the retail market, um, it, you know, we've seen, particularly I think in the U.S. market, um, kids buying uh, shares in GameStop and uh, AMC, etc., based on you know posts on Reddit. Yeah. Um, so, uh, to the extent to which social media or the use of AI in another context could yeah. exacerbate a, or create a herding trend. Um, in the retail space, is very, I think it's very evident, and okay. we're, we're very worried about that. Um, I think all of us are. Um, in the wholesale markets, I think it's less likely to materialise. And, and I believe also that that's partly because I think we will have to figure out how to licence AI models. Yes. Um, because yes. ultimately the end user or the person who has instigated the model is responsible and accountable for the activities of that model. That's right. Um, so I, I think we'll probably figure that out first. Figuring out what to do in the retail side of the, the market I think is much more challenging. Yes, but there are human beings making the actual final decisions. That's your, yes. that's your anxiety. If we could have systems, machines to do it all. Or you can influence someone okay. to do okay. something. Okay, okay. Yeah. So, so let me ask you a very general question um, about the overall systemic risks to our financial system. How vulnerable do you think the UK is relative to other countries, but also absolutely, uh, to 
some sort of total system collapse or major systemic threat that pro properly derails the financial system temporarily or permanently. What keeps you awake at night? I'm actually, I do sleep quite well. <laughs> um, I don't worry about a total apocalyptic uh, incident in the UK, partly because I've, I've worked for many years in the UK um, FMI environment, and I understand how much hard work and, and effort goes into that every single day, 24-7. Um, I, I think you know what we've been through in the last few years actually demonstrates that you know whether that be the, the pandemic or various other incidents that have happened, uh, and particularly even we've had crises where a market participant has failed and we've t removed them from the payment system in a in a very controlled and reasonable fashion uh, with the collaboration of regulators and and other market operators. Is that not I because of the legacy of sort of analog? systems that effectively have these sort of bulkheads in the system? Are you not concerned about the extent to which these new technologies could lead to system-wide to system -wide, uh, danger? No, because I, I believe that systems that now are, are actually configured to, to put stops of some kind, uh, but also just to have risk controls. Uh, certainly the systems I'm familiar with are you know, audit-based, risk-based control frameworks where you actually have to evidence that you, know, you had permission to do what you said you were going to do and you executed it well and, and the result was what you thought it was going to be. Okay. Um, and in that context, I think the people involved take that role and those risks extremely seriously and their responsibility to the public, quite frankly. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I'm glad to hear you, you're, you're sleeping well, because that, that means that we can too, so thank you. Um, what, what um, well, a personal question, if you don't mind. When did you last use cash for a transaction? Actually, a couple of days ago. Um, this is a personal note. Yes, go on. Were you, okay. What was it? You were, Went to the Cotswolds. There's yeah. no broadband. Yeah. There's no, uh, there's very little um, phone signal, nothing works, and you pull up in a car park and there's a great big sign that says connect to our Wi-Fi so that you can pay for the car park. Yeah. Um, I, I'm probably one of those people okay. who, I believe in a, in a, a balanced um, portfolio of choice for the consumer and, and for businesses, and um, in many cases there are many places in the UK where you still need cash. Um, so do you think it's just a technological barrier before we can get to the point where we don't need it? Um, I, I mean, you, you also answered in your questionnaire your concern about financial inclusion, and I wasn't sure if you meant that... Um, uh, and I'm thinking particularly around a potentially digital pound here, CBDC, yeah. beyond, moving beyond cash altogether, whether you think that CBDC is an answer to the challenge of financial inclusion that we currently have or that it could create challenges. So I'd be interested on, to understand what your issue is there, but also is it simply about the barrier to the tech and if we can get that and if we can sort out the financial inclusion issue, you would you think that CBDC could uh, be useful to us? And, and even if it means that we have even less cash in circulation or even no cash at all. If I can deconstruct your question. Yeah. The, the, at the beginning you asked, um, am I, uh, I, th I think you asked, uh, do I think that there's a reality in which we don't have cash? Mm. Um, I don't think we're anywhere near there yet, at all. Um, my own personal experience working in Sweden, where everyone thought it was going to go cashless many, many, many years ago, it, it still hasn't happened. It's not going to happen. Um, are, you, are you neutral about that development? Do you think that is simply about what the market I'm, wants? I'm very neutral about it because I believe in choice and convenience for consumers. And I think sometimes, you know, in the parlance of technology, people, it comes down to use cases. It comes down to what are you trying to do at that moment in time? And is cash the answer? Is ele something electronic the answer? Yes. But, but, but the use case is determined by the available, the, well, the infrastructure. Are, yeah. Um, so it's not as if the, the system, which you're now going to be part of, can, can be neutral about this because you, know, you and government will be making decisions about what is available to people. Do you think we need to be deliberate about preserving the option of cash? Yes, okay. I do. Okay. Um, for, at least for the foreseeable future. Yes. There's still a significant demand for cash. Yeah. And very lastly, if I may, just on CBDC, because obviously the bank and the uh, government have been consulting on this, um, uh, and I understand you welcome the steps that have been taken. Um, and you just raised these issues about financial inclusion um, and the technology. Do you have concerns about the privacy issue and the potential for 
the system, whatever that is, to have insight into people's spending and ultimately potentially to have control over their spending. Do you, are you concerned about program programmability, the programmability of a digital pound? I'm extremely concerned about people's individual privacy. Um, it is forefront of my mind um, simply because we don't yet know at this point where our data will end up. Data, you know, if, if, you, if I think back, uh, someone posted pictures of my children when they were children or very small on, on Facebook or on, 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 on some social media site, um, they may still be there 40 or 50 years later and I'm pretty sure that my kids won't appreciate it at the time. Um, I think sometimes we have to try to think ahead of ourselves, you know, what would that mean for somebody in five or ten years' time? I think also um, I'm, from my global work, very conscious that um, we sometimes take decisions because we believe we, we operate in a benign um, democracy, and it, that's not the case for very many people in the world. And so actually decisions that we take, we need to be mindful of the fact that the situation for other people might not be quite as benign as we anticipate. Do you think it will be possible to introduce a digital pound that preserves individual privacy? Yes, in the same way that we all go shopping right now and, and um, we get receipts, uh, what do we do with them? Where do we store them? What, do we, you know, what data and information is currently available on the well, system? The state, doesn't have, the state doesn't have that data at the moment. The potential is that it would under a CBDC. I personally do not believe that the state should be carrying p private information of individuals regarding their activities day to day. Um, I, I do believe that in the design, as I understand it, of the current... Um, workings of CBDC in the UK, that would still remain with commercial banks. And I'm happy with that approach. Thank you, Danny. Um, I don't see any of my other colleagues indicating they want to ask you further questions. I have a few more of my own, if I may. Um, do you own any cryptocurrencies? No. Have you ever owned any cryptocurrencies? Um, would you ever own a cryptocurrency? Probably highly unlikely. Highly unlikely. Um, at business school, one of the first things I was taught was that you should never own a significant shareholding in a single company. You should never have... You mentioned at the beginning of this session that your MasterCard holdings were shares that you were hoping to keep for your retirement. And quite apart from the conflict of interest potential of that holding, just you're going onto a committee which is looking at the financial risks of the UK economy and you have got a massive undiversified financial risk in your retirement planning, if you don't mind me saying. Um, what do you think about that risk? So that's something I've consulted with my financial advisor on um, and, and I do hold other pension investments. I've you know, had like anyone else over my career, had to invest in my pension from the beginning of my career. Um, so I don't consider it to be an outsized or a disproportionate risk for me personally. All right. What do you think of the Prudential Regulation Authority's proposals in terms of implementing Basel 3.1, what is known as Basel 3.1? It's something I actually um, plan to look into in far more detail um, because I've started to understand the um, small business factor or the SME factor and how it operates and the offsetting against um, uh, exposures in other countries, for example. Um, Basel is a very complex set of tools. Um, I'm quite heartened by the fact that it exists and, and we continue to seek international collaboration on the pace at which other countries will adopt similar um, measures. I, I think my primary concern is regulatory arbitrage where you know, the US goes in a slightly different direction potentially um, and the EU and the UK might be in a different position which would put us potentially less competitive. Um, we've published what our views are on that, uh, so um, I'm sure you've had a look. Um, in terms of your professional competence for this position and your personal independence, are there any other points that you want to share with the committee before we uh, move into our private session? I don't believe so. I think I've been very transparent. I, I understand how important this is to the committee um, and to the bank. 
Um, I've set out uh, for the bank secretary, you know, all the information I think that I could dream of or find. Um, and I've also been uh, very transparent with them with other commitments that I have. Um, I do some mentoring as a voluntary activity, um, and you know they've just set out just ensure that you're not mentoring anyone in a PRA regulated firm. You know, so we've gone through all of these different items in great length. Um, so I'm very comfortable that I've actually satisfied um, their requirements. Um, and those of your close family members, I think they look at those as well. Absolutely, don't they? Yeah. yes, yeah. in great length. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right, unless my colleagues have any further questions, I'm going to say uh, the magic words, order, order. Thank you very much for your evidence this morning. We're now going to meet in private. Thank you very much. The Grimmond Room. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended.